Let me tell you about six-minute sermons. This is a, a tradition we started several years ago. We did it as a one-off, and we had so much fun that we just kept doing it. And now it's your tradition, and we can't stop doing it. But it truly is one of my favorite Sundays of the year. In just a minute, I'm going to introduce six different uh, people that are going to be speaking today. They all have six minutes each, and it's kind of like a relay race, and the microphone is the baton. And uh, for fun, and I, I told him this this morning, it's probably more fun for you as the audience than for them as the speaker, but for fun, you'll see a timer on the screen that'll be counting down as they're talking, all right? And, and this is what I told him, is that 6.01, if they go over at one second over, you have permission to start heckling them, okay? I'm totally kidding. Do not do that, okay? Um, at seven minutes, we really do heckle, though, okay? Um, but it really, is for, it really is just kind of a fun dynamic, and I've asked all six of these to talk to us uh, on the theme, which is our life group theme of don't do life alone. And, and I just believe that these six unique voices are going to help us uh, to, to hear from God today. You know, th this is a, a tagline we use for our life groups, but it's really, it's also just a rate, really great way to live life. I believe it's scriptural, and I think these guys and, 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 and ladies, they're going to help us uh, to, uh, to understand better today why God doesn't want us to live life alone. So let me tell you who you're going to hear from today, uh, and then we'll kick this party off. You're going to hear today from Dan O'Brien. He's going to kick off the party, all right? Uh, no pressure, Dan, but you got to get it started, all right? Then you're going to hear from Kim Wingate. You're, I like this. I, you're, they're cheering in faith. This, they're like, this is going to be good. This is going to be really good. Then, then you're going to hear from Mel Krein. Where is Mel? I can't. Oh, there, there's Mel over there. Then you're going to hear from Shante Coleman. And I gotta tell you, Shante came in this morning. Have y'all have y'all seen like on a like, like a professional athlete how they come in with their 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 over the ear headphones on and they are focused? That's how Shante came in today. I mean, she just like she was coming in. She's ready. She had her headphones on. I'm a, I'm like I'm ready. I, come on, bring it, Shante. This is gonna be so much fun. Uh, and then uh, you're gonna hear from uh, Susie Green. Woo! -hoo! I feel the faith rising, and, and then Nathan Kofal is going to bring it home, and go ahead and cheer for Nathan. I told Nathan he could have any extra time that the others left over, but if they all go over, he doesn't get to preach today, so we're teasing though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be so much, so much fun. So you know what, church? Uh, we have a tr another tradition. Usually at the beginning of the message, I ask you to pause for about 30 seconds and to, to pray a prayer that I believe really positions our hearts to hear from what the Holy Spirit has for us today. I hope that you came ready to hear from God today. I believe that God has a unique word for every single one of us. And I'll just tell you, I came ready to hear today. I've got my notebook ready. I'm taking notes today. I, I believe the, that the Holy Spirit's going to speak through these six speakers. He's going he's gonna to talk to us today. And I'm, I'm ready for that. And so I just want to invite you, would you right now, would you just, just push all the other thoughts aside and ask the Lord to speak to you today? And I believe he's going to do that. Do you believe that? All right, let's pray. Father, we open our hearts right now. You've, uh, you've picked six, six speakers to bring your word today, and we are so excited about the word that you've given to these six. And Holy Spirit, we're asking right now, we open our hearts to hear from you. We want to hear from you today. Lord, what is it that you have for me and my family today? Lord, we listen for your voice and we're just anticipating what you have for us right now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Help me out right now, and let's get this started. Help me welcome Dan O'Brien. Welcome to our online viewers. 
and guests, but I want to especially welcome those of you who are here each week sitting in these seats. Uh, I love your smiles. I love your handshakes. I love your hugs. I love being together. So thanks for being here today, and I look forward to the year ahead and our times together. Um, you know, my family and I own a small business here in town, and um, that's a lot of fun. But what I really love is getting to serve Harvest on our board of elders, along with uh, Justin Serrano, Mark Howell, the ever-smiling Mark Howell, Ben Medina, uh, and of course, Pastor Jason. Uh, and Pastor today is admonishing us today with a warning. Don't do life alone. And haven't you had enough of the isolation, the separation, and loneliness that so many experienced over the last two years? I know I and my family have. COVID struck fear in the hearts of many. We were asked, no ordered, to mask up, isolate, quarantine, separate, stay home. These are actions that are opposite of why we do church. Let's read Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 together. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. This warning was as true for the ancient church as it is today. And here, during what are likely the last days of Christ and the church on earth, we are encouraged to not forsake doing life together. Now let's look at a few words you hear in church. The first one, communion. Jesus Christ himself told us to do it often in remembrance of him. And do you think he was just telling us to have a, a, a ceremony, drink wine and, and break bread together? I really don't think that was the point. I think the point was the community. I think it was the sharing of this meal. I think that was really the last thing he wanted. The word communion indicates unity in coming together, and community is its close cousin. Webster's Dictionary says community means a group of people having the same interests, religion, or race. Communion means intimate fellowship or rapport, having communication. And you know, it takes two or more to communicate, for most of us anyway. You know, if nothing else, the past two years have shown us there are powers, spiritual dark forces, as the Bible calls them, that are um, directing people, politicians, the media, and whatever other evil tools they have at their disposal to divide and separate the church. And the church has been at the center of these recent political and social um, attacks, just as it has for centuries. Why? Because the church stands when others bow. We are powerful when we come together. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us two are better than one. And here at Harvest, our favorite promise, because I hear you praying it and proclaiming it regularly from Matthew uh, chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus told his disciples regarding a matter of sin and separation in the church. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now say it with me, for where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Where two or more are gathered together in my name. I left out the important word there. It's not Skype, it's not Facebook Live, it's not Microsoft Teams, but gathered together. If you haven't already done so, I hope you will take the time to say thank you to Pastor Jason for standing up and bringing Harvest back together when the state of New Mexico still had us on a stay-at-home order, locked down, isolated, separated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Church, we need each other. We are powerful when we are together. Amen, Mike? <laughs> All right. Now, not only do outside influences divide and separate us, but our own human minds can do a number on us. Depression, fears, doubts, suspicions, misunderstandings, hatred. Who here doesn't ever experience any one of these? When we stop communing together, when we fail to communicate, we lose perspective. It is dangerous when we stop sharing ideas, talking about our fears, our frustrations, or disappointments with each other. Communication needs community. Community requires communion. Now, I'm not saying that we will all have or even need to have the same perspective. I guarantee you and I have some very different perspectives based on our life experiences and what God has chosen to teach each of us in our communion with him. 
My life experiences are shaped by growing up as a child of divorced parents, by living in very different parts of the United States, by attending great schools and then attending New Mexico schools, <laughs> by my studies, <laughs> I love you teachers, thanks for trying hard. <laughs> By my studies, my personal studies in biology, pharmacology, sociology, and business, by coming to Christ just in time at the age of 20, I say just in time on purpose, at a local Christmas Eve service, and by meeting my wife-to-be the very next weekend while visiting Sunday school for my very first time. I looked at her that day, literally, and knew she was going to be my wife. And as of today, the lovely woman sitting right there in the third row has been my wife for 34 years. Happy anniversary. <laughs> and it's also been shaped by serving in three significant Albuquerque churches, of course, Harvest being the most and the mo most fun. Some of you have shared some of these experiences I listed, but none of you has had the exact same experiences. So without ever asking or talking to me, why would you think you know what goes on inside my head? I certainly can't know what goes on inside yours unless we talk, unless we communicate, right? And you know that it's true for your spouse, your children, your friends, and those you won't even talk to anymore because you disagree. I'm going to refer you now to Acts chapter 10 and 11 to read on your own because of the clock. But to give you some context, it's a wonderful story about perspective. And if you recall the story, it involves Peter's vision where a sheet is let down from heaven full of unclean animals. And the Holy Spirit told Peter to kill and eat. And sorry, hunters, the point is not that you get to kill and eat fresh game. The point is that Peter's perspective was wrong. He was taking the gospel to the Jews. And thankfully, the Holy Spirit stopped him and said, hey, the gospel is now for everyone. It is for Jews and Gentiles alike. And while you're in your Bible study time later today, reread 1 Corinthians 13 with perspective in mind. And in closing, we can find forgiveness by uh, humbling ourselves and admitting we don't have the same perspective or life experiences as others. Forgiveness then becomes the gateway to communion and community. Forgiveness then becomes the path that leads us back to doing life together. Thank you all. I am here today to welcome you all to Harvest. Those that are visiting, as Dan has already said, we welcome you. Those that are online, thank you for being here. Have you guys ever watched Wild Kingdom, the animal sitcom or the animal movie? Well, have you noticed how the lion always targets a weakling? How the lion always tries to get that one that has been separated and away from the tribe or for away from the herd. Um, when the animals venture off from the herd, sometimes disaster awaits and, one, and the one that's trying to do life alone is left alone, isolated. Uh, instincts will tell the parents or the animals' moms that the young ones, the weak ones, the vulnerable ones are not capable to do life alone because they are not mature enough uh, to fight off danger, uh, to fight off deception and the schemes of the enemy, which are many. The adult animals then tries to somehow warn them that they are in grave danger and attempts to nudge the baby back to safety. I'm praying that the Lord will lead me back to safety because I'm shaking. <laughs> because the mother is wise, she guides their baby back to safety and the net of the herd to protect the baby against the trickery and the sneakery of the lion. Well, church, our Father in heaven nudges us too. He has sent us the help in the form of other Christians to help us do life when other with other believers and to help watch out for us. Christians, we love each other. We watch out for each other. That's our goal here on earth as well. 
to walk with us through our trials and our temptations. We don't need to do life alone. We shouldn't do life alone because the scripture tells us clearly in Hebrews 10, 25, let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The Bible tells us in John 10, 10 that we too have a predator. We have an enemy and a deceiver that wants to kill us to steal our joy, and he wants to totally destroy us. We have a predator church, and if we are working together as a herd, we can help each other. The enemy can do it very well when we isolate, when we are feeling depressed, and when we try to do life alone. The enemy is watching. 1 Peter 5, 8 says it this way, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, to prey on. Don't do life alone, Harvest. He seeks those who have chosen to do life alone without the word of God in him and without fellowship and without connection. He seeks those who isolate and remove themselves from the flock, from the herd, from the congregation, from the church. Solomon, the wisest guy who ever lived, tells us in Proverbs 18.1 that a person who isolates himself uh, seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise judgment. So here we learn some things from the word of God. We learn that in the context of Christian living, it is not wise to move away from the body of Christ. Not wise. In other words, don't do life alone. Sometimes we have circumstances such as abandonment that can force us to do life alone. I get it. In that case, Psalm 2710 is for you. But I'm speaking of the choice to do life alone without letting others in. Listen, church. The choice to do life alone away from other Christians is unbiblical, it is unwise, and can be very, very dangerous. Once again, the message here is simple. Don't do life alone. When someone gets into a situation where they are isolated and separated from fellowship and from the encouragement of other believers, the potential for us to get into uh, lots of problems is huge. We begin to think wrong. We give in to temptation. We proceed without counsel, counsel, and we proceed without caution because we don't have that community to nudge us back to safety. We've talked about the young animals straying away from protection and the herd and how it is only a matter of time before the eyes of the predator are on that animal. Guess what, y'all? It's no different in the spiritual arena with us as believers. We have to help each other. We have to ask for help. We have to receive that divine help. We are not called to do life alone, y'all. Whether we realize it or not, we indeed need each other. Whether we're black, white, or indifferent, we need each other as Christians. We can't do life alone because we need fellowship with one another. We need to confess to one another. We need comfort from one another. We need hugs from one another. We need one another, church. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 25 says, if we are part of Christ's body, we will recognize our need to fit into the body of believers, to fit in with the body of believers together. We have a gift that God has given us, and we are to share that gift with the body. You can't do that alone. We are meant to do life together, church. Yes, we have an individual purpose, but uh, an individual purpose in life, but we also have a unified purpose in life. The church is the place where we come together to encourage one another as members of the body of Christ. Together, we fulfill an important uh, purpose on earth, and that is to do his will. We can't do life alone, alone y'all. We need each other. I keep saying it. We need each other to sing together, because I can't sing across the street. <laughs> we need each other to worship together. We need and enjoy eating together and having communion together and celebrating together. We most importantly need each other in our sorrow to provide strength to each other. 
Romans 12, 15 says, we need to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. We need people, we need doctors, we need lawyers, and we need Indian chiefs in our lives, y'all. Don't let others do life alone either. Reach out to one another, call them, check on them, send them a note, get with them, check on them, even if you are not the one they want to hear from, do it. Church family, don't forget to pray for one another. Pray together, too. It is the most powerful tool in the Christian's toolbox. When trouble comes, don't separate yourself and stay there. Don't get stuck. I tell you, it is a trick from the enemy. He wants to isolate you, to deceive you, to overpower you, to tire you out, to make you weary, to depress you, to confuse you. It's a trick, guys. God has given us resources in the church so that we don't have to fall for trickery. Listen, there's life that's beautiful out there. Check out Acts 2, 42 through 47. It's such a beautiful description of Christian fellowship. Lives thrive. There is unity. Yes, people are doing life together up in Acts, y'all. <laughs> they focus on harmony. Why? Because each believer focuses on the well-being of others and not just themselves. They are not doing life alone in the book of Acts. We can't do life alone here on earth. We cannot do life alone because we need each other, even when we are clapping to a worship song. I'm going to try to make you laugh a little bit, but have you ever noticed how our white brothers and sisters <laughs> clap on beats one and three? And our black brothers and sisters uh, clap on beats two and four. Well, if you put us all together, then we'll never miss a beat. Harvest, go be the church. Good morning. I'm kind of a two and four guy, by the way, Kim. Don't do life alone. Each of us ought to ask ourselves two questions. Number one, what should this statement mean to us? What should this statement mean to me as an individual, to each of you as individuals? And number two, are these words found in the Bible? Does God say anything like this? It is a profound, yes, he does, by the way. God does say this. The second question, God, does God say anything, is, is, is the answer is yes. God does say this. Perhaps not the same phrase, but the content of our theme is found from the first page of Genesis to the last chapters of Revelation. It is a profound and singular description of God's plan for creation, both now and in 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 eternity. The first question is harder. It's harder because it's subjective. It depend on e e depends on each individual's response to what God is telling us. So, what is our creator, our designer, telling us? Let's go to the beginning, Genesis, the book of origins. And let's look at two words. First, at the word translated good in chapters 1 and 2. The Hebrew word means pleasing or desirable. Starting in verse 4, God created light and he called it good. Next he created the dry land and he called it good, pleasing, desirable. Next, vegetation. It was good. Next, the sun, the moon, the stars, what we see in the sky, and he proclaimed them good. Winged creatures came next. He pronounced them good. Then land creatures he pronounced them good. Next in the order was man. And finally, in verse 31, after God was all finished, he stepped back and he surveyed all that he had made, and he called it good, except that he added a modifier to our word good. He called it very good. The Hebrew word translated very 
means exceedingly great, beyond measure, and even vehemently good. The next occurrence of the word good is a few verses later in chapter 2, but it communicates something entirely different. It also has a modifier, the word not. God is saying it is not good for man to be alone. Our creator himself is identifying the problem. This brings up our second word, alone, which ties directly into our subject, don't do life alone. The Hebrew word translated uh, alone refers to an only, an only. Why does God view this as a problem? Verse 26 of chapter 1, let us make man in our image. So what about God's image is so important to our theme? Here's a little different emphasis. Let us make man in our image. The creator himself in whose image we were made is not and only, not alone. John 17 paints a beautiful picture of this. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what was God's solution to the problem of man being an only? Eve. So is the problem solved if a man simply finds a wife as I found my Eve 44 years ago? <laughs> no, not at all. Matter of fact, it may have been enhanced. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Let's understand the scripture. The physical type is always presented first and then the spiritual reality. God introduces in the very beginning the concept of a physical marriage, which is a type of the spiritual marriage that will mark the culmination of all things in eternity. Marriage results from a wedding. A wedding must have an Eve. So what are the elements of this first wedding? Well, the bride was Eve. Uh, the groom, Adam. The officiant, God himself, the ancient of days. Witnesses, billions of the heavenly host. That's the physical. Now, how about the spiritual that I spoke of? Who is the spiritual bride? Who is the spiritual groom? The spiritual bride is the church, the unified, perfected church. The church is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is composed of all individual believers in perfect unity. Believers spread across the entire earth. Believers projected backwards in time to Adam himself. Believers projected forwards in time to the last one born in this current age. This is the church. This is the living body of Christ. This is the great cloud of witnesses mentioned in Hebrews. This is the group of martyrs under the altar of Revelation. This is the bride of Christ. And the groom? The groom is Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the faithful and true, the bright and morning star, the officiant, the ancient of days, the witnesses, billions of heavenly host. Sound familiar? The last pages of Revelation depict a wedding, just like the first pages of Genesis. Eternity will be spent in perfect and corporate unity with the myriad of believers throughout all time as the bride wedded to her husband. Don't do life alone. It's not God's plan. So, Father God, giving honor to you in everything that you do, you are so worthy of the praise, and I'm so thankful to be able to stand here on today and to share your word with the body of Christ. I want to thank you for my pastor, my first lady, for giving me this opportunity to come up here and just share whatever it is that you've placed on my heart. Let there be less of me and more of you. Let our hearts and our eyes and our ears be attuned to the word that you have for each and every one of us today. Let me speak your truth and your truth alone. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't do life alone. 
Doing life together, you can do it in certain different ways in the body of Christ. One of those ways being life groups. One of the benefits of that are we can come together in an intimate way. We can pray together. We can share. We can learn God's word together. We can exhibit, exhibit the fruits of the spirit with each other. But for that to be effective, we must also be doing life with Christ. Amen. Yes, life groups can help introduce and guide one to God, but we have to be willing to place ourselves in a posture, as Pastor was talking about, of wanting to do life with God. See, it's more than just Sunday service. It's more than doing life with the body. It's all about having an intimate relationship with God. See, when we do that, doing life with the body is more effective, and you'll see God's hand at work. Example of that would be you can go to a life group when you're doing and God will lay, on, lay, your, lay you on somebody's heart for you to come alongside of as a prayer warrior. He'll connect you with that particular person that can encourage you and guide you in your purpose that God has placed on your heart. He can line you up, align somebody to say, hey, in this particular body of Christ that you are attending, why not use your gifts as service where I have placed you in that season of your life. But there's one big thing that oftentimes hinders us from doing life with Christ and doing life together. And one of that thing is, is sin and non-repentance. Sometimes we forget what Jesus did on the Calvary for us. So we tend to want to retreat and be alone and be in our shame. And when I begin to think about this word today, God brought me to the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. I, I've, I've read this particular verse several times, and I've often heard in churches they'll call this the wayward son. Very familiar with it. We leave God, we turn our back on him in church of something we think will fill us, but God is the only one who can fill us completely. See, when we go through life doing it without God, we tend to waste, we tend to go empty, we tend to be dry and in need of. If you look at verse 13, it says this, and in not many days after the son, younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous uh, living. Don't do life alone without Christ. Another thing that happens when we do life alone without Christ, we find ourselves not walking in purpose. We try to adapt to join ourselves to the worldly things instead of the spiritual things that fuel us and sustain us. We hinder or we suppress the Holy Spirit. We're not walking in purpose. If you go to verse 15, it says, he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now I could break down 15 and just tell you a little bit. As a Jew, a Jew would have been unbearably degraded by feeding swine. Also, the owner would have been to be a Gentile since both keeping and feeding swine were forbidden to Jews. Not working in your purpose, not walking in a line to what God has called you to do. That's what living alone and not doing life with Christ or even the body of Christ can see you, you can find yourself in. But God is so good because in the midst of your troubles in the midst of your sin in the midst of whatever is going on the holy spirit will bring you back to him he'll bring you back to truth in spite of yourself and we see that happening in the following verses through 17 through 18 he came to himself it says in verse 17 and when he came to himself and he said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and perish with hunger i will arise and go to my father and i will say unto him father I have sinned against heaven and before thee and I am no worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants and he arose and he came to his father see God will not abandon you because he wants to do life with you I know I'm speaking to somebody today hallelujah God wants to do life with you. But see, we have to be in a position of willingness of understanding that, hey, I'm going to do my part, which is I'm going to arise and I'm going to come to the Father with a repentant heart. And I'm going to believe in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I want to do relationship with you, Father. I want to be in an intimate relationship with you, Father. I need you. I love you. I desire to be with you. I'm going to be intentional about making you a part of my life today. 
And so as you see here in the Bible, he, he makes that decision that I don't, I, you know, I didn't have to be here. I was already in the presence of God, but I thought I knew better. I thought I had to go away from doing life with my father and my family and my community. But now that I realize that I want to come to you with a repentant heart, and it says here in the word that in the breakdown for those particular verses in my King James study Bible, he knew his offense and he was willing to abide by the implications of it, a mark of genuine repentance. And when this happened, hallelujah, it says that the father saw him. His father saw him in verse 20, and he was yet a great way off and had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. See, when you go back to the Father and you decide, I want to do life with the Father, these are the following things that will happen. He'll have compassion on you. He'll run to you before you even make it halfway. He'll kiss you. He'll love on you. He won't talk about what you did. I'm happy you're here. I've been wanting to do life with you since the beginning of time. Before I even formed you in your mama's belly, I loved you. I had purpose for you. See, doing life with God, it looks like this. It means that God is going to dress you. Hallelujah. He's going to his own clothing. He's going to cover you. He's going to feed you. It talks about this in verse 23. He's going to fill you. He's going to fill you with purpose and authority in him. Hallelujah. And when you go through and you look at this, it said, you know, but the father said to his servants in verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this son for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. What I want to encourage you today for somebody out there that's like, I, I want to do life with God. I want to do life with the body of Christ. I'm going to church, but I'm not talking to anybody. I don't know how to connect. Well, I would encourage you to start with starting an intimate relationship with Christ. And then he'll open your heart up, and then you'll find yourself with a desire of wanting to go to Bible study. You'll find yourself in that Bible study with the right leader, with the right group of women or men at the right time. And it'll start to affect your heart. you start to connect. You'll start to want to share. You'll start to want to exist exhibit the fruits of the spirit you start working walking in your purpose and I just want to say this to that particular person don't be afraid and remember that there is blood on the cross for you I love you I'm praying for you stay encouraged amen thank you Well, I've never wanted to be first in my life so bad so that I wouldn't have had to listen to all these awesome speakers. But you know, we're all different, so this is going to be a little different from everybody. And I just have to say, Pastor Jason, I thought that you said 60 minutes. So I'm going to have to cut mine down just a little bit. Bear with me, you guys. We'll make it. When I heard the subject of the sermon and started really thinking about the title, Don't Do Life Alone, it caused me to reminisce. I started trying to think of times in my life when I've been alone, really alone. You see, I've never really known that feeling. But one thing that I have always known is that time alone with Jesus is so important. Nine times in the Gospels, we are told that Jesus went to a lonely place to be with the Father. He sought out solitude so he could seek the, will, the Father's will for his life. When we are alone, God has the opportunity to receive our undivided attention and speak to us. In Matthew 26, 36, it says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, sit here while I go over there alone and pray. He began to be become sorrowful and troubled as he prayed. For you see, Jesus was praying for his life. He asked God if there be any other way to remove the agony of the cross to please do so. It says that Jesus took his disciples, his friends, and asked them to sit and pray with them. Now we all know how that went. They fell asleep, but... He still wanted them with him. 
Jesus could have gone alone, but he knew the importance of having others with him, supporting him and lifting him up. I love my special quiet time reflecting, relaxing, and resting in his peace. But in reality, I really need to be in fellowship with others. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. It is okay to depend on others to help us, to encourage us, and to be there to do life with. In May 2020, we moved to Rio Rancho to be near our kids, Zach, Nicole, and our two amazing grandchildren, Lily and George. And we treasure all of the time that we get to spend with them. So, you might think that our move was full of happiness and joy. But, actually, I had lived in Carlsbad my entire life. We, we both had lived there our entire lives. And we had a lifetime of friends in Carlsbad. I've even had some friends since elementary school that I am still friends with, and some of our friends are as close as family. It was a hard move for me. I was very homesick for the friendships that I left behind. I'm one of a close group of 10 friends who I used to meet with once a week. We were accountability partners, each other's encouragers. We laughed and had so much fun together, but we also shed tears with each other. Galatians 6.2 reads, Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry one another's burdens. It took me about a year to finally adjusting to living here. Last summer, Bose and the kids planned a party for my 60th birthday and brought my girlfriend group up for the weekend. We had such an awesome time. And it was what probably reassured me that they're going to be my friends no matter the distance between us or how, how, how far any of us are apart, nothing's going to ever change that. But a major catalyst to my adjusting was when Pastor Jason did the mental health series on Elijah and getting out of the cave. I was so encouraged by that that I decided it was time for me to step out and meet people and become more involved in Harvest. I started serving as a greeter, attending Bible studies, and becoming involved in the worship ministry as well. Not only did that help me emotionally, but I believe that serving others is the heart of Jesus. Romans 12, 13 says, Take a constant interest in the needs of God's beloved people and respond by helping them and eagerly welcome people as guests into your home. I attended the same church in Carlsbad for 43 years, and I was the worship leader, and I was in a band for most of those years, spending hours writing songs and rehearsing and using the gifts and talents that the Lord had given us brought us really close together, and that was really hard to leave behind. You know, when you live someplace all your life, you become somebody's wife, somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, that worship leader, you you just have so many ways that people know you and you move to a new community and especially a brand new church and you're just a guest, a visitor at first. So I really realized that it was so important for me to become what God wanted me to become. Moving away caused me to reevaluate my calling and gifts. I'm so thankful that Harvest has given me opportunities to serve. Thankfully, we have met so many new and special friends and are continuing to develop relationships with many of you here today. This has really helped me adjust to my change. And this isn't in my notes, but I just want to go, I, I want to go on record as saying this is one of the most loving, outgoing, friendly generous, caring churches that I've ever been in. And I thank you all for that. 1 John 4, 11 says, Delightfully loved ones, if he loved us with such a tremendous love, then loving one another should be our way of life. 
1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Because of this, encourage the hearts of your fellow believers and support one another just as you have been doing. I'd like to close by reading this short story. Two men, both seriously ill, occupied the same hospital room. One man was allowed to sit up in his bed for an hour each afternoon to help drain the fluid from his lungs. His bed was next to the room's only window. The other man had to spend all his time flat on his back. The men talked for hours on end. They spoke of their wives and families and their homes and their jobs. Every afternoon when the man in the bed by the window could sit up, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate all the things he could see outside. The man in the other bed began to live for those one-hour periods where his world would be broadened and enlivened by all the activity and color of the outside world. The window overlooked a park with a lovely lake. Ducks and swans played on the water while children sailed with their model boats. Young lovers walked arm in arm amidst flowers of every color, and a fine view of the city skyline could be seen in a distance. As the man by the window described all of this in exquisite detail, the man on the other side of the room would close his eyes and imagine the picturesque scene. One warm afternoon, the man by the window described a parade passing by. Although the other man couldn't hear the band, he could see it in his mind's eye as the gentleman by the window portrayed it with very descriptive words. Days and weeks passed. One morning, the day nurse arrived to bring water for their baths, only to find the lifeless body of the man by the window who had died peacefully in his sleep. As soon as it seemed appropriate, the other man asked if he could be moved next to the window. The nurse was happy to make the switch. After she got him in the other bed and made sure he was comfortable, she left him alone by the window. Slowly and painfully, he strained to look out the window, his first real look at the world outside. It faced a blank wall. The man asked the nurse, what could have compelled his roommate to describe such wonderful things outside this window? The nurse responded that the man was blind and could not even see the wall, she said. Perhaps he just wanted to encourage you. Philippians 2.4 says, Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. Don't do life alone. Thank you guys for sitting through uh, eight and a half minute sermons uh, with us this morning. (laughs) You know, last time I did this, I went just a little bit over and I haven't heard the end of it from Brady ever since. And so I'm going to really try hard to hit six minutes. And so let's get right into it. I'd like to draw your attention to John chapter 15. Um, So context here is really important. Jesus is literally, he's just had the last supper. He's just told Peter, you're going to betray him. He's just said, hey, Judas, go do what you're going to do. Right. And something gets his attention. We don't really know what it is. But, you know, many times when Jesus would go into a parable, he would say, you know, he probably saw something and then he would draw the the apostles attention to it. And so he says in John chapter 15, starting in verse one, he says, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And right after this, he goes in, uh, starting in verse 12, it says, This is my commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love no one has for this than the person lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends because all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. So there's three quick things that I want to kind of draw to your attention. First of all, you were not designed to do life alone. You were not designed in a vacuum. You were designed as a branch to be plugged into the vine. And if you are plugged into the vine, you will bear fruit. And that fruit ultimately leads to a love of one another. If you think about that, because of Christ's connection, we have the ability for the vine dresser, who is God, listed in kind of, you know, he says, hey, my father is the vine dresser. The vine dresser will prune us so that we bear more fruit. And then immediately Christ goes into this idea of, hey, I command you to love one another. This is what I give you. In fact, actually, in, uh, earlier in John, we're told that um, people will know we're his disciples by the love that we share one another. Two, the vine dresser actually, or the connection to the vine, actually produces connection to other people. What's interesting there is when you start thinking about, um, and somebody said it earlier in their six-minute sermon, they said they talked about purpose. When we have a common purpose, when we are connected to the vine, the branches bear fruit. And your fruit looks an awful lot like the fruit of the other people that are connected to the vine. An apple tree, all of the branches of an apple tree bear apples. And it is our connection to each other and our connection to the vine that allows us to ultimately fulfill Jesus' command to love one another. The th- Paul kind of addresses this a little bit um, in Ephesians 4, where he said, starting in verse 1, he says, Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul could have said a hundred different things here. He could have said, I command you to go do great miracles that are worthy of the calling that you've received. I command you to do great evangelism worthy of the calling that you've received. But what he actually said was, bearing with one another in love. That's super important. The third thing that I want to tell you is that right connection with others centered on Christ facilitates spiritual growth. So when we as uh, branches are connected to the vine and we're bearing fruit, that fruit ultimately gives us strength and growth spiritually. Paul addresses this in Ephesians a little bit later where he lists out in, um, in verse 12, he says, hey, these are the ministries. These are the things, some to be apostles, some to be preachers, some to be teachers. And then he goes on and he says, hey, this is why those things are given. First, to equip the saints for ministry. That's what pastor means when he says, hey, go be the church. He's equipping you for ministry. Second, to build the body of Christ towards unity and faith and the knowledge of Christ. We all need to know Christ better. And I've heard Brady say this a hundred times, know Christ and make him known. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And then the last one is, He actually gives us a a reason or a a kind of a standard, a measurement. And that measurement is that we may live up to the standard of Christ. And if that doesn't, like, scare you just a little bit, maybe it should. Because what it's actually saying, that measure is literally like a picture of weights on a scale, and we're being measured against the standard of Christ. That should kind of be heavy when we think about it. And so this ultimately leads to a result. And the important thing about when we do life connected is the result. And Ephesians 4, 14 through 16 says, As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, and by the trickery of people, and the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body is fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part and causes growth for the body, building up itself in love. And so I want to leave you with this. If you are not connected to the vine, you can't bear fruit. And it doesn't matter what life group or what small group or whatever it is you decide to be a part of, you have to get connected to the vine. But if you are connected to the vine, God will prune you to bearing more fruit. And that fruit will ultimately enhance the body and our ability as a church to do the ministry, to go be the church, to connect and encourage. Thank you. Brady, he did it. He did it. He's the only one that did it, but he did it. (laughs) I'm glad glad you made the joke about eight and a half minute sermons. I'm going to have to change that next time. You know what happened is... 
My wife did a six-minute sermon a, a, a while back, and she went over, and that, that's just giving everyone permission after that to go over. So, are you glad you came today? Wasn't that awesome? Kim, I learned a new word, sneakery. I wrote that one down. I, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to use that. Sne- that <laughs> sneakery. Sneakery. Uh, by the way, can I have the worship team uh, join me uh, as, we, as we get ready to close? Sneakery. And Shante, while you were preaching, someone texted me and said, come on somebody, Shante's bringing the fire. And I text back and I said, where do I get those headphones? So next week, if you see me pre-service, I might have headphones walking around in here. What a great day, right? There's so much depth in the body of Christ. And that's one of the things I love about six-minute sermons is we realize there's, there's a lot more going on than, uh, than we're often aware of. God is, is up to so, so much. I, uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I, all I did with these six speakers is I just said, will you talk to us on the theme, Don't Do Life Alone? Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't pay Susie to, to give her testimony uh, of how um, life groups and Dream Team uh, have added value to her life as, as they relocated here, but, but I probably should pay her later. I mean, we made after, I mean it, was just, it was just amazing, you know, and, and uh, I wrote down, I think it was, it was Kim who said, living life alone is unbiblical, unwise, and very dangerous. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's just so true. It's, I was like, just tell, us, just tell us the truth, Kim. Just tell us how it is, you know? I just, I love, I love this. If you're, if you're not convinced after that, there's, I don't think there's anything I can say that's going to that's gonna change your mind. But I do hope, I felt like this was just an appropriate way to start the year. I do hope that you will make a decision. I'm not going to do life alone. Now, I hope you don't think this is one extended commercial for life groups and dream team, but it also kind of is. Um, If today you're like, I don't want to do life alone, I'm just telling you, that's the two best ways that we have at Harvest for you to get connected uh, to other people. Now, I'll air out a little bit of a pet peeve in saying this, but, but I'll tell you the other option. The other option is you just start living life with other people, okay? Here's what I'm telling you. You don't have to wait on the local church to create an event for you to meet other people. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but like you can invite someone to go to coffee, do you know that? You just, you just do it. Like, you don't have to wait for your pastor to create an event. You just go, hey, I think I like you. Why don't we go have coffee and figure out if we really do like each other, right? And guess what? It's okay at the end of coffee if you don't like him as much as you thought you might. Just go do, just go ask someone else. Just go, hey, I think I like you. Let's go, let's go eat some lunch. Let's go hang out. Let's do something. Let's play, right? Like you can do that, right? And that's my pet peeve is when people wait on the church to plan your social calendar and plan all, just start doing life with one another. And I had this revelation the other day. I don't remember who I was talking to, but I had this revelation because I've always believed that the church should push against the cultural norms, uh, whatever those are in the day. I mean, there, there were cultural norms that we read about in the book of Acts, and the early church was pushing against those. And and, and this was an interesting revelation the other day because I realized that one of the cultural norms that we're now pushing against is this idea of not living life alone. You know, Dan kind of kicked it off and, and got us thinking about how that there's so much happening in the world today that's driving you towards isolation. <laughs> I mean, you're literally being told, do life alone. And the countercultural biblical message, this isn't political, I'm just talking about what the Bible says, is don't do life alone. Don't do life, listen, 2022, do not do life alone. Just like make a decision. I am not going to do life alone. Life is better with other people. Do you believe that? All right, why don't you stand with me? This has kind of become our... Our new pattern is after the word, we have one more worship song. And I really like this pattern because really what we're doing is we're just giving the Holy Spirit room to just work 
these truths into our hearts. And as we sing this final song, um, I'm okay if you do less singing and more listening to the Lord. <laughs> so sometimes that's the appropriate response. And I, I don't know, I don't know which message, which phrase, which person, which I don't know which which thing really grabbed onto your heart, but would you just spend a couple of minutes kind of mulling that over with the help of the Holy Spirit, figuring out, all right, God, what are you, what are you stirring me? What's my action step, right? We, we don't want to be like James talks about. We don't want to be people that look in the mirror and walk away and forget, right, what we look like. We want to look and make a decision and go and affect change that would bring about what the Holy Spirit's wanting to do in our lives. So our worship team is going to lead us just for a couple of minutes. I'll be back and we'll pray together and then we'll dismiss. But would you, would you just open your heart right now to what the Lord is saying to you? Would, you? would you allow him to work on you? Worship team, why don't you lead us?